Thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. If you enjoy what we do, you can support the Society by becoming a member today. Please visit our online bookstore and our eBay store online. Links below. Ancient Athens is known for many things. The birthplace of democracy, the home of Plato, Pericles, and Euripides, among a host of other famous philosophers, playwrights, and statesmen. At the height of their power, the Athenians also produced one of the most iconic coins of the ancient Greek world, one that was produced for centuries on end, and one that still, in a way, is produced today, in the form of Greece's one euro coin. This, of course, is the Athenian owl. Hi. I'm Peter Van Alphen, Chief Curator here at the American Numismatic Society. The Athenians were among the very first Greeks to produce silver coins. The small trickle of coinage they produced in the 6th century BC became a colossal flood of coinage in the 5th century, which was fed by their local fountain of silver, as the playwright Aeschylus put it, referring to their silver mines at Laurion in the eastern part of the Athenian territory of Attica. This deluge of Athenian coinage inundated economies in the Aegean and parts of the Near East, where the Athenian's owl became one of the most influential, longest lasted, and widespread coinages in the ancient world. In one form or another, the owl was minted virtually without interruption for nearly 500 years, from the 6th century BC until the 1st century. No other ancient coin, or really any coin since, can claim such extreme monetary endurance. Because the Athenians produced such an astounding number of owls, over 100,000 of them exist today, forming the backbone of many collections. Here at the ANS, for example, we have over 3,000 owls of all periods. Most of these have come into our collection through a series of donations, including those from Edward T. Newell, one of our early presidents, and Burton Y. Berry, a U.S. diplomat who formed a large coin collection in the middle of the 20th century. Now, I'll show you a closer look at these owls in a few moments, but first I want to back up a bit in time to look at what the Athenians were producing before the owls to get a sense of why this coinage was so significant, not just to the Athenians themselves, but also to their contemporaries as well. The Athenians began to strike coins, mostly didrams weighing about eight and a half grams, in the middle of the 6th century BC around the time that a fellow named Pisistratus, after numerous attempts, consolidated his tyranny over Athens in 546 BC. Why the Athenians, or in fact Pisistratus, desired a coinage at this point, we really can't be sure. But a role for other elites in their production is suggested by the coins themselves. While the reverse has a simple, unadorned inku stamp, the obverses of the coins have changed in designs, or types as we call them. Fourteen types in total are known, including various things like amphoras and wheels, as well as animals or parts of them, such as my favorite, this horse's rear end. Why this particular design? God only knows. Earlier generations of scholars saw in these changing types the heraldic devices, or in other words, basically family crests, of those individuals presumably responsible for issuing a particular series of coins under Pisistratus' authority including the guy with the horse's rear end as his family's crest. To this day, the series is known as the Wappenmünzen, which is German for heraldic coins. Sometime around 525 BC, Athenian coinage underwent significant changes. The Wappenmünzen were abandoned and an entirely new coinage was introduced. On the obverse of this new coinage was a presentation of the Gorgon's head, or Gorgoneon. This was the head taken from the monster Medusa that could turn onlookers to stone, which the hero Perseus, as the myth goes, gave as a special gift to Athena. On the reverse were a couple of alternating designs, including a facing lion or panther, as on this coin. In addition to the design changes, a completely new denomination was introduced, the tetradram, or four dram coin, weighing around 17 grams, one of the largest coins produced up to this time. 
This new tetradran de denomination would serve as the cornerstone of Athenian minting for the next five centuries. Taken together, these changes seem to be a sign that the Athenians, or Pisistratids, were reorienting their monetary policy to focus more on economic activity beyond the borders of Attica rather than within. Because of its association with Athena, the Gorgonaeon, unlike most of the types on most of the Vapenmünzen, represented the Athenians all together. This was, in other words, a first attempt to brand these coins as Athenian, perhaps for the sake of an outside audience. And in fact, hoard evidence does show that the Gorgonea circulated beyond Attica in greater numbers than the Wappenmünzen, indicating that the coins found some success in outside markets. It would seem that with this new tetradram, the Athenians created a value-added version of what was to become one of their primary exports, silver from the mines at Laurium. Apparently, however, the Athenians or Pisistratus's sons, who were now in charge after their father died in 527 BC, were not completely satisfied with the design of the Gorgonea. Yet again, a completely new coin was introduced. This time, the somewhat obscure reference to Athena, the Gorgonaeon, was replaced on the obverse by Athena herself, helmeted and in profile. And any question regarding the identity of the deity was answered by thematic continuation on the reverse of the coin, where we find the owl, Athena's bird. And if there was still any question of the coin's origins, it was spelt out next to the bird, Alpha, Theta, Epsilon an abbreviation for Athenion, of the Athenians. There is simply no other archaic coin that so completely drives home the point of civic origins, and evidently the point was so well taken that the Athenians saw little need to change the basic design of this coin for the next five centuries. But answering why this new design was introduced is a bit of a contentious problem. Because the beginning of the owl coinage can be dated by hoard evidence to around the time of the democratic reforms in 508 BC, after the Athenians had finally given the knife to the Pisistratids, a number of scholars have attempted to link the owl coinage to the political expressions of the new democratic government, and to explain the extreme longevity of the owl as a political symbol of the later Athenians' quest to preserve their freedom from tyranny. Now, appealing as this idea may be, there is no conclusive evidence to lock in the date of the first owls, and arguments by other scholars offer an alternative narrative. The owl was introduced by the last of the Pisistratid tyrants, Hippias, and obviously not as a symbol of democracy, but rather the result of another Pisistratid attempt to rebrand the silver for export. And personally, I go back and forth on this. Whatever the true origins of the owl design, the Athenians never gave it up, no matter how old-fashioned it began to look compared to other more modern-looking coinages, like the spectacular, if not a little bit Baroque, late 5th century Sicilian tetradrams. In fact, this is much like the case in, here in the United States today, where we continue to use our old-fashioned-looking greenbacks, the basic design of which have been around for almost a century while the rest of the world has long since moved on to much, much more colorful currency. But while the Athenians did produce a rather massive and monotonous and old-fashioned looking coinage, with the owls at first glance seeming to be pretty much all the same, there are in fact differences introduced over the centuries that are worth noting. In the aftermath of the Persian Wars, as the Athenians and other Greek cities set up their anti-Persian alliance, known initially as the Delian League, the Athenians settled down to a steady, sizable production of owls that included for a short time in the 460s the largest owl ever produced, the seriously impressive decadram, a 10-dram coin weighing around 42 grams. Production ramped up still more in the years following the transfer of the league treasury from the island of Delos to Athens in 454 BC marking one of the steps the Athenians were taking to convert the Voluntary Delian League into an empire run by themselves, now with their former allies compelled to pay tribute to the Athenians. And needless to say, there was a little bit of pushback, which led ultimately to the Peloponnesian War, 
a decades-long conflict pitting the Athenians against the Spartans along with all of their various co-fighters and allies. All throughout this time, the Owls became even more stylistically conventionalized, reflecting the now colossal scale of production. This massive output continued until nearly the end of the Peloponnesian War at the end of the fifth century, turning out hundreds of millions of coins, coins that the Athenians needed to fight the Spartans, run their empire, and conduct trade, especially international trade. Truly massive hordes of owls have been found in the Near East and Egypt, some with up to 20,000 coins giving a sense of the scale of the use of owls in this international trade. How soon after the disastrous end of the Peloponnesian War, for the Athenians at any rate, they resumed the production of the owls and at what scale remains one of the least understood areas of Athenian numismatics. By the middle of the fourth century, however, when things were looking up again, they were at it once again. Sometime around 350 BC, the Athenians embarked on another massive striking of owl coinage this time with an updated design, which now featured a distinctive pie-like element on Athena's helmet, and a much more crude-looking owl on the reverse. These pie-style owls, which the Athenians produced until the end of the fourth century, also circulated widely in the Near East and elsewhere. In the wake of Alexander the Great's conquests and the late 4th century wars between his successors over who would rule the various conquered territories, the Athenians lost a lot of their power and prestige, caught up between the warring factions. While they continued to mint owls sporadically throughout the 3rd century, the output wasn't that great, and the owls themselves differed from the pie-style owls only in subtle ways. In the 280s BC, for example, they struck owls with this four-fingered helmet design. It took almost a hundred more years, but in the second century BC, the Athenians at last recovered some of their power and introduced a new owl that was so completely fresh and even up to date in its design that numismatists refer to it as the New Style series. These new style owls are remarkable for the wealth of administrative data recorded on the coin's reverses, which typically include the inscribed names of the three magistrates responsible for a particular issue. Because of these inscriptions, we know that the Athenians produced new style owls for roughly a century, down to the time that Athens was finally completely sacked by the Roman general Sulla in 86 BC. Before that, however, the scale of new style production seems much like that of the earlier 5th and 4th centuries. And like those earlier owls, new style owls also circulated in the Near East and elsewhere. Sola's sack of Athens didn't bring an immediate end to the Athenian owl, but its days were certainly numbered. A now Romanized owl continued to be struck for a few more decades down to around 42 BC, when the Athenians finally bowed out to the competitive pressures of the Roman denarius and ceased silver coin production for good. By this time anyway, that great flow of silver from the mines at Laurion appears to have finally dried up. So all told, after 500 years of production, the Athenian owl truly is one of the greatest coins. If you'd like to learn more about Athens Owls, especially the 3,000 some odd specimens in the ANS's collection, please do visit our online collection catalog Mantis. I can also recommend this brand new book, The Athenian Empire, which appears in the joint ANS Cambridge University series, Guides to the Coinages of the Ancient World. I'll put the links below. Enjoy. This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Since 1858, the ANS has supported research and education in numismatics and the history of money. With a collection of over 800,000 objects, an extensive library, a dynamic publishing arm, and ever-improving online research resources, we have become one of the largest numismatic institutions in the world. If you wish to support the ANS and the work we do, you can join as a member and become a part of this historic community. Go to numismatics.org membership to see options and prices.